presence of the Lord um, is really great. And uh, so on behalf of the Baptist Free Baptist family, we want to welcome you this morning. Uh, and Vito's been away, so welcome back, Vito. Uh, I see Dave just walked in here. Welcome back. Good to have you back. We're glad that you're back from the... That he didn't, that didn't keep you in the USA. <laughs> Um, so welcome back to Anne also. And then to all our other friends and family who have been away for a while, welcome back. It's good to have you back with us. And uh, we look forward to having you enjoying the worship service with us this morning. So those who are online, also a warm welcome to you. Um, so it's really great just to be here together that we can uh, enjoy worship together. And uh, maybe you see the great blessing after this worship today. And, uh, you join us. For those who are here for the first time, a very special welcome to you too. We will be privileged to have you here. We feel honored that you would have chosen to be here today. You could have been anywhere else, but you've chosen to be here with us today, and so we are honored, and uh, may you be blessed, and uh, may you be strengthened, and may you be edified as you go into this week that lies ahead. Let's bow our heads in prayer. Our dear loving God, and heavenly Father, we come before you, and we thank you for this day that you have given unto us. We come to you with grateful hearts, Lord, because you have carried us for another week. You've carried us through difficult times, through trying times. There were those, Lord, who were unsure of what was going to be happening. There was fear in our hearts. And yet, Lord, you have been faithful, you've been gracious to carry us through and to bless us. And so we come to you with hearts full of thanksgiving this morning. So we come before you, Lord, and we and we praise you for all that you mean to us. That you would love us so unconditionally that we will answer our prayers when we call. And so this morning, Lord, even though we are undeserving, we want to bless you for all that you will bless us with. So we bow down and we worship you. We thank you, Lord, for the work that you have done in, our, in our, the life of our church and uh, for the work that you have done with the lives of our believers, our friends, our family, for all those who we see so regularly, but also those who we don't see so regularly, Lord. Even in their lives, we have been working. And so we want to thank you and we want to bless you. We thank you for the Westlake United Church and their ministry to the residents of, of Westlake, uh, for the care that they give to the, to the people and also to the children that they care to care. We thank you, Lord, for all that you have done, that you are doing for those children. May they and their families be blessed as they come to be to know of you and to know you. And may they be drawn closer to you. And may your name be glorified in all that, you, that they do. We think of those, Lord, who cannot be here with us alone. We uh, would love to be here to worship with us, but because of illness, because of health, they are unable to be here to, to do so. We think of the near of Lisa, as she prepares for childbirth. Lord, we know that she's passed you, but uh, so in this time as she prepares, you ask that you will be with her, that you will strengthen her, that you will give her the strength to be able to endure and be able to go through this process and have great success in bearing the child. We think of Tish, who is in the hospital at Friedenburg, Lord, receiving treatment. We ask that you will just continue to be with her, that you will strengthen her. So also, Lord, for Neville, who is in hospital, recovering, pray that you will bless him, that you will strengthen him from day to day, Lord, that he, as he regains his strength, he will also remember, Lord, to bring glory unto your name for all that you have done for him. We think of Kent and Paula Brown as they prepare, Lord, for her heat operation. And Lord, we want to ask if you will be with him. We will use the doctors, the medical staff, the knowledge to bring healing to a Lord. And may that, Lord, in turn be glory unto your wonderful name. Lord, as we prepare to lift up your name in song, we want to welcome you in our presence. And I'm going to ask that you will move, Lord, from heart to heart this morning, from person to person, that you will bless our worship, and that, that we will inhabit the praises of your people this morning. Bless the musicians and the singers as they lead the song. And this we ask, Lord, not because we are worthy of it, but we ask it in your name with us and Amen. Beloved, as we get into this day, before we get the season and the musicians to come and lead us, um, I just want to give us a, a word of encouragement this morning. I know Pastor Kevin's going to be preaching about praying, uh, praying for the lost. 
Thank you that saved. But it's also us who are saved who, who need prayer and we need encouragement and we need uh, to be strengthened. And, uh, and one of the things that was mentioned this morning as we were praying at the back there was about fear. And there's always a fear, people have fear, there are things happen, things go wrong. And uh, in this week, we uh, suffered the same thing. I can't tell you my daughter in law's uh, story and her journey. But suffice to say that uh, she's pregnant at the moment. And in this week, there was a scare that she might um, have a threatening abortion. And um, so we had to go there and she lost the gospel. And so this fear creeps in. But before we trusted in the Lord, um, the Lord has been faithful, has been faithful to carry us through. And then we thought there was one, we were surprised to find number two. So while there was fear on the one side, we glorified the Lord for surprising us with the second one. So um, we are grateful to the Lord and we want to encourage you this morning not to, don't give up. Don't give up praying, don't give up trusting the Lord. So I want to read you just from uh, Mark chapter uh, 10 verse, four, verses 46 to 32. Um, I think there's something in mind that the Lord wants to give us in this time as we, uh, as we read the scripture. Now they came to Jericho and as they went out of Jericho with his disciples uh, and a great multitude as, let me start again, now they came to Jericho. As he went out of Jericho with his disciples and the great multitude, Brian brought the mayors, the son of the mayors, sat by the road begging. And when he heard that it was Jesus of Nazareth, he began to cry out and say, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. Then many warned him to be quiet, but he cried out all the more, Son of David, have mercy on me. So Jesus stood still and commanded him to be called. Then they called him the blind man, saying to him, Be of good cheer, arise, he is calling you. And throwing aside his garment, he rose and he came to Jesus. So Jesus answered and said to him, What do you want me to do for you? The blind man said to him, Rabboni, that I may receive my son. And Jesus said to him, Go your way, your faith has made you love. And immediately he received his sight and he followed Jesus on the road. From the scripture, there's only just three, just three very brief things that I want to mention. Three brief reminders I think are very important, especially for us. The first one is, that the Lord Jesus knows about you. He knows about you. He knows about your struggles. He knows what you are going through. He knows what your difficulties are. Your doubts, self loathing whatever it is that you are battling with, the Lord knows about you. Second thing you want to remind us of is that despite the noise of everything happening around us, we have noises around us. We have like all kinds of things. There's DSTV and people. The people clamoring for your attention in many ways. But despite all that noises, that he still hears you. When you cry out to him, he will hear your voice. There may be many other voices calling out to him, but he's going to hear your voice. So don't give up. And then the third thing is that the Lord Jesus Christ is interested in you. You particularly. In what world? You, what you are going through, the help that you need, He will help you. So my encouragement to you this morning, don't give up calling on the name of the Lord, because He will answer you. As we will hear later on, as Pastor Kim preached about praying for the lost, don't give up on praying for your unlost friend, or for your lost friend, or for your family members. Keep praying. Never give up. <coughs> Never give up on trusting him with your situation because he will come through to you. So we want to encourage you with those words this morning. May the Lord bless you and strengthen you as you bear this possibly bear this in mind as in, in, in your mind and keep them in your heart. As the singers come forward and the musicians take up their positions, we just want to have a just pray very briefly. Ask that you will just buy a bit. Maybe you've got a pray in this morning. I just want to include you in the place, so if you do have a need, I'm not going to embarrass you, I'm not going to come forward. 
And just give me an indication, just raise your hands and just lower it again and we can include you in the prayer. Lord, yes, my brother. If there's anybody else, we will pray. We pray to you. Lord, we, we are those present this morning who are with us, who need your help. Lord, we lift them up before you this morning because uh, when we come to you, Lord, your word says that we are fast to nothing. And that we should get our cast all our cares upon you. And so we cast him upon you this morning. You saw my brother's hand, Lord. You know his heart. You know his need this morning. We want to ask that you will meet him at the point that he's been in need this morning. Lord, we come and ask that you will be glorified as we lift up our voices in song this morning. That you will come and follow this chapel with your presence, with your healing presence, with your comforting presence. We pray that you will bless this time of worship, Lord. We pray, Lord, in this, in your most wonderful and holy name of Muslims. Amen. Let's listen to the time of the worship this morning.
seven beautiful. He's standing all of them, almighty, all powerful, omnipotent God. A God for whom nothing is impossible. Beloved, just before we continue, just a few announcements before we go into some prayer, prayer items. Um, just a reminder that we uh, will be having a baptism service sometime soon. And so all those who are interested in going to the woods of baptism, uh, following the Lord in the, in the step of obedience, uh, please speak to Pastor Kevin uh, so he will guide us on board. So, uh, nothing to be afraid of, nothing to be ashamed of. It's a very great experience. So, please speak to Pastor Kevin about that. And then, just a reminder for the men there's a fellowship that takes place on uh, Sunday mornings between 7 30 and 8 30. Um, so, you are most welcome to please join us. It takes place at the church office in this room. So, uh, please do join the men. Um, then, um, we have Times when people arrive, people also have to leave, and so today we we don't say farewell to Sabrina, which is not going to have a physical presence with us. Uh, she promises that she will be online watching us every week, so uh, so that's great. Uh, we may lose a person in physical status here, but um, spiritually she will still be with us, and uh, she will be with us online. And so we want to wish you well, Sabrina, and as you go into the Catalan area, um, as you go and take care of your grandchildren, so do enjoy that. It's not a privilege that many have. I think of those in the church here yeah, whose families are overseas and so on, and have seen grandchildren in once every four or five years, that is, you've got a special opportunity. So may the Lord bless you, and may He continue to be with you, may He carry you um, as you go through into this time. Um, it is a time when we will be with us. We're going to see you in church, and uh, so we want to bless you and we want to ask that the Lord will continue to be with you. May you go with the scripture that we, that we, uh, that, he, that he wants to give you. Uh, I'll find the scripture later and I'll give it to you. May the Lord bless you. Then um, our folk also we have, we grow older year, day by day and year by year. Uh, today is uh, Alistair Derby's birthday. I'm not sure if he's here today. <laughs> oh, there you are. Uh, happy birthday, my brother. May the Lord bless you and may He continue to carry you for as many years as you desire. Thank you. Thank you for your life in the church and for what you mean to us. And then also to uh, Gabby, whose birthday is on the first. Um, may it be beautiful. And to all the Saudi, who's on the first. Um, may you all enjoy the, the time that the Lord gives you and uh, thank you for the work that you do in the church and the life of the church. And, uh, for being a part of our lives. Uh, may the Lord bless you. Then just uh, some, also just to be asking just to pray for um, Kent and Paula Brown, and you know, she's praying for the heat replacement this week. Uh, just continue to pray for them. Uh, also continue to pray for Neville who's in Cabin. Uh, thank you for the prayer so far that we've given for him and, and Jean, and um, I'm sure they appreciate it as, little, as much. So may the Lord continue to bless you as you as we carry them in prayer this morning, this week, in the days of my Let's bow our ways in prayer as we commit our beloved to the Lord. Lord, we come before you today and we want to say thank you that we can come to you and that we can call upon your name. That you indeed is all our awesome God. Indeed, we stand in awe of you. Because you know our needs, you know our requests, you know our concerns, but yet, Lord, when we call upon you, it is as if we have not ever, ever called on you. So we also want to praise you and worship you, Lord, for blessing us so tremendously. You have blessed us, Lord, with uh, this Alistair with another year. Um, Gabby will be enjoying her birthday and celebrating her birthday on the 1st and Audrey on the 5th. And we want to say thank you, Lord, for their lives. Thank you that you have kept them, that you have carried them. We thank you for what they mean to us as a church, as to, um, to their families. We pray that you will continue to bless them and to keep them safe and to keep them under your, your watchful care. This morning, Lord, we also want to say thank you for families. And uh, we want to lift up all these families before you. We lift up Shadrach, my lady. 
P.T. Peter Mangutula, Sheldon Bone, Lucilla Moyo, Andrew Shinova, Justine, Andrew and Amos Mutzingwa. We bring them all before you, Lord. You know their needs, you know their faces, their faces differ from ours, and so has their needs differ, Lord. And our faces differ, so their needs, O oh Lord, uh, are different to ours. And so we have to ask that you, O oh Lord, will meet them at the point of their needs. Bless them. Grant them your strength. Strengthen their family ties and their bonds. And as they go around, Lord, and their relationships are visible to the world, may it be a great testimony of your great blessings on their lives. We thank you for Sabina, Lord, who has been with us. Lord, as she travels, as she goes to the Canada area, we want to ask if you will be with her, that your hand of protection will continue to be over her, and that you will bless her. Bless her with her family. May she be a testimony unto them as she speaks of your goodness and of your grace and of your mercy towards her. May they even be drawn closer to you by her testimony. We come before you, Lord. We also want to lift up our government before you in this day. And we want to ask you for help and guidance for our government. They, they need to deal with so many things, Lord, deal with corruption. There's a plethora of problems that they that are facing our nation and plaguing our nation at this time. And we want to ask that you will undertake it. You will help them and that you will guide them. That you will allow them create opportunities so that men and women of integrity will be appointed in government so that justice might prevail. So we seek your help, Lord. Because only you are the one that can change things, to bring changes that we so desperately need. Right now, Lord, we want to commit Pastor Kevin to you as he ministers your word. We ask that you, Lord, that you will give us receptive hearts and that we will have fertile soil so that when the word is, it might grow in our hearts and that we might bear good fruit that testifies of your goodness. Bless us, Lord, as we lift up our voices once again in song and bring glory to your name. We ask this in your holy name with much thanksgiving. Amen. We ask the, the musicians and the singers once again to come and uh, lead us in worship and be after the head of the pastor Kevin. And, May the word that we will preach be strength, edify each and every one of us as we listen to the Lord and what the Lord has to say to us. Um, I know it sounds cool, but we're living right now, so I always will make me that we can do this.
but from your perception, from where you're sitting, now you don't know the human hearts, you don't know, only God can see the human heart, but by judging the fruits in their lives, the things they say and the things that they do, you know that they are not a believer. They just don't get it that they're not Christian. Some of them, of course, are emphatically outright clear and will tell you that they are not believers. There are people in, that we all have influence with, that we all have relationships with, that some connection with, that do not maintain the same ethical uh, principles or moral values that you hold to. Uh, they do not have the same priorities that you have when it comes to God. The tree does not bear fruit, we can say. You don't see the fruit of the spirits by their attitudes, by their actions. They give them away. There is no spiritual flame there. The lights are not on. And uh, there is no spiritual flame in them that gives off lights for you to perceive that there is some spiritual life there. Is there anybody who doesn't have such a person? You're welcome to nod off, make yourself a cup of coffee. Uh, the, fact, uh, the truth is we all know and have worked with such people. We have them at school, they are our friends, they are our teachers sometimes, they are people in our family. There are many permutations of this person that we have in mind today. Keep that person that you are thinking of in mind as we read through and as we consider the scriptures to us. What they believe perhaps is not biblical and their faith is faulty and lacking. That person, keep them in mind. As a born again believer in Jesus Christ, for you, who is full of the Holy Spirit, with your spiritual eyes wide open, having God's love been poured into your hearts that has changed your heart of stone and has given you a living heart of flesh that feels for God and feels for people, you have a burden for the lost. It is right to feel a burden for them. It is right to feel uncomfortable for them. It is right for us to even have fear for them and for their eternity, even if they have no such fear or no such consideration uh, for those things. So as a born-again believer, with that burden for the lost, those you know and those that you care for, you rightly should have a real concern for them as Paul had for the Israelites. Even sometimes, and maybe you feel this too, a frustration for the things that they do. You ever feel the frustration? They do the most ridiculous things sometimes. The things that they say are, so, are, are just so wrong and they don't see it. There should be that sense that there is a problem there. Something is not right. Do you cut yourself off from them? Do you try to avoid contamination or their, their negative influence over you and over your family? I can tell you there are so many times where I have put our finger on that button to leave the family group because you just can't bear it anymore. And then I think again about what influence I can still have over those people. Do you leave them to avoid contamination and their negative influence? Or do you consider what Paul is saying here? You see, there is a clear distinction between them and us. Paul begins this passage by saying, Brothers and sisters, this is now, of course, not a reference to a biological family. You have a biological family that traces its human ancestry all the way back to Adam and Eve. Through them, you were born into the flesh. Through your biological family, you have inherited their sin as it's gone down from generation to generation, all the way back to Adam. In them, in the flesh, in blood, you are family to them. But this is not the person that Paul is thinking of here, is he? Yeah, he, as you as a Christian, you also have a spiritual family that Paul is speaking about. Israel was his biological, Paul's biological family. But as a Christian, he's referring to, he says, brothers and sisters, the NIV puts it like that, who Paul is speaking of here. They are, they are your family in Christ. 1 Peter 1 verse 22 says, You have deep, sincere love for each other from the heart, for you have been born again, not of perishable seed. That would be your family, your biological family. But you've been born again, not of perishable seed, but of imperishable through the living and enduring Word of God. You have been brought into this spiritual family that you are a part of. Not people 
A lot more people are universally saved. Paul is making a clear distinction here. Not everyone is going to heaven just because of God's love, because of His mercy and His grace. We've got to remember that He is also a holy God. That He is perfect. He is unlike us in so many ways. Yes, we're made in the image of God, but we are unlike Him because He is perfect. He stands in perfection and we don't. Sin sets you apart because it is an offense to a holy and a righteous God. And so we should rightly have concern for the unsaved. This is why we should rightly do missions. But why we should rightly be all be missionaries in serving the Lord in this regard. Not just because their lifestyle, those of the unsaved, might be dangerous and might be harmful to them and even harmful to others, but because they are lost in their sin and need saving. We want to we do the work of the gospel not just so things will get nicer for them and better for them, but because we have an eternal concern for these people. That they will be condemned when they stand before this holy God to face judgment if they do not believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. As all people surely will stand before God. And so our deep, heartfelt desire, like Paul had this desire, our deep, heartfelt desire is to see them come to a saving knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ by faith and so be saved. It is right to have such a desire. For them. It's a love desire. You love it. If you didn't feel that desire, quite honestly, you don't care for them. You, you don't love them. You don't have a real concern for them. You should have such a desire. It is right for you to feel such a desire because of both the positive and the negative consequences. They are just, the stakes are just so high. The positive blessings or the negative consequences of where these people stand. I don't know how it is, but somehow on my YouTube, you know, you watch YouTube, you have a YouTube app on your phone or your whatever device you use, and YouTube is a very clever thing, the internet is a very clever thing. It sees what you watch and then it starts sending you stuff. So the more you click on it, on that video, you watch that video, the more it starts sending you those things. For one of how come there are certain things you keep on coming because at some point you probably click on something YouTube thinks are they interested in fishing all of a sudden you're getting all these fishing movies and things coming up on your phone somehow I don't know how but I started getting clips of people in the Grand Canyon doing silly things uh, like standing posing on these little precipices of rocks and people falling even off rocks as they saw videos of people taking selfies when they fall to their death. There's all these videos, and actually some of them are quite traumatizing to even watch. I don't suggest you, you watch them at all. But you find them and you see they show people standing on the edge of a cliff and posing as if, you know, they're, they're doing funny things and leaning over and playing as if they're going to fall. Every year, hundreds of people fall to their death despite all the signs around warning them of the dangers that are there. As we look at the unsaved, we should have that same desire and concern for them. They are standing on the edge of a cliff. They're standing on the brink of eternity. And if they do not come through the Lord, they are going to a certain eternal death in hell. Spiritual life or spiritual death now in this world, but the joy of heaven or the horror of hell for all eternity. Now I'm sure you want what's good for them, don't you? You want what's best for them. You want to see them prosper and not harm if you love and care for them in every way. But many things are less important for them. Uh, and, and their problems are lesser issues. In fact, some of their problems are caused as a result of them not being Christians. And even as a result of the life of an unbeliever. So wanting their problems fixed. Praying that they get a job, or praying that they get better help, or praying for these things, that they come into money somehow, stop borrowing money from you, and all these things that you might be praying for because of the irritation that they might cause to you, and the concern that they are, you've got to recognize our lesser issues are smaller things compared to eternity and the consequences of where they will spend eternity. Wanting the problems resolved, is hopelessly futile until they are saved. 
So Jesus Christ is the key that opens the door to their eternity. And our desire to see them saved is paramount and above all else. First and foremost, above all the lesser things that we can pray for, I'm not saying don't pray that they get a job, don't pray for better health, I'm not saying don't pray for those things, but recognize there's a bigger issue here that you need to concern yourself with. When you want something, you do something, isn't it? When you want to see something happen, you must make it happen. You've got to see it happen. When you want to see the lost saved, what do you do? Run over to them and start telling them about Jesus. I say, no, stop for a minute. What does Paul do? He says, my desire for them and my prayer for them is to see them saved. He has a desire, as you shared, that same desire for the lost. So what does he do about that desire? He prays for them. First, the desire leads to prayer. We must pray first before we even say a word to the lost. We pray because we know that unless God does the spiritually effective work of calling a person, they cannot come. They cannot see the light. They can't change what they are doing. It is a spiritual rebirth, not a natural birth. But Alyssa will give birth to a baby today, probably, most likely, they are in the hospital and will be in that process today, giving a natural birth into this world. But here we're talking about a spiritual birth that we cannot do in ourselves. We cannot bring about a spiritual reform, spiritual change in a person, unless the Spirit of God is there at work and busy. We pray because we know that it is a spiritual battle that rages in that person. It is real in their lives. And we know that the devil will put every obstacle in their way to keep them blinded to their sin and to keep them in their ways, in, in, in their particular lifestyle. That they need a life-giving Savior is obscured by all these other things. But the devil himself will obscure the Lord from their sight. And that's why we must pray. We pray to God who is greater and more powerful than any other force or any other being. And so Paul's prayer was for the Israelites that they might be saved. Now remember that as a Jew, these were his people. This was his family. This was his tribe. This was his nation in the flesh. Are you praying for your people? For your lost people? For your community? For your colleagues? You pray for your friends. And no, of course, you pray for your enemies and for their salvation. But you know, I sometimes think about this, how different I would be and how different you would be if not for the grace of God in our lives. If not for the Lord in our lives, we would be such different people. Different, unlikable people, if not for the Lord Jesus Christ in our lives. And so some have, so we have some hope through our prayers, and that there might be some chance of them changing as we pray. There's a miraculous work, a spiritual work that has to take place in them. And unless we're praying, there is no hope for them. But as we pray, there is some hope and there is chance of such a thing taking place. You see, if Christ is the door to salvation, prayer puts the gospel key into that lock. And the Holy Spirit unlocks that door of their hearts. To open that door to their hearts to the kingdom of God. A helpful practical way, just as something to, you can do, to pray for your family, your friends, and those people you want to put before the Lord, is to start a prayer journal. If you have it to read, where you can record who you're praying for. Specific names of, of non-Christian people. And when you're thinking of that, think about backslidden people as well. Because after their backslidden state, it's an indication that they never really knew the Lord. And so you must treat them as an unbeliever. Rather treat them as an unbeliever and pray that God would do a work in bringing them back to the Lord as you would pray for a non-Christian who's never professed the Lord in their lives and, and pray for their salvation. Pray that God would work in their lives. And as you do that, make a note of the progress that God is making in them. As you said, just to encourage you in your prayers that you don't give up and you keep praying. And I'll say this to you, you'll need wisdom in this, whether to do this or not. 
but often it helps to actually tell them, I am praying for you. Careful how you say that. You don't have to go to them and say, no, I'm praying that God will give you no rest and that you will be broken and brought before the cross. Uh, you don't have to tell them like that. But tell them that you are praying. It shows them that our genuine love and concern is for them. And through that, it can start a deeper conversation with them. Instead of about the game that you saw yesterday, or the cars and the houses and the things that we busy ourselves with conversation with, it starts more eternal conversations about deeper, more meaningful spiritual things. And so start that conversation. That can then lead you in and give you a springboard into deeper conversations around the gospel, around eternity, and around what they need, who they need in their lives. So don't try and share the gospel before praying because you're wasting your time. You really are. Perhaps the reason you're not concerning yourself with them and praying for the lost is that you don't realize their need. So many things can hide their need to be saved. Paul testifies against the Israelites and says that they were zealous for God. You would think these people, they don't need God because they are so, they don't need a savior because they are so zealous for God. These are, are people who believe in God. They're not atheists. They, they're not even agnostics. They're not unbelievers. They believe in God. They are zealous for God. Paul testifies against the Israelites that they were very zealous for God. And now of course, zeal for God is a good thing, isn't it? To, to have zeal and, and passion for God is a good thing. We should want it and pray for it for our own lives and we would have the same kind of zeal for the things of God that we see in, in those who don't believe. Or those who, who do believe but don't have, and are, who are not saved. Zeal without knowledge is not a good thing. And he points out here to us that their zeal is not based on knowledge. Their zeal involved powers of prayer. We should pray for that zeal, shouldn't we? Their prayer involved powers of prayer. Hours of reading the Torah. And we do the same. And our zeal be the same. They, they praise and they, they hours of reading the Torah. They were followed by hundreds of, of rules and do's and don'ts. You can't eat this, you must eat that, don't touch this, don't do that. Every aspect of their lives was governed by the law, the Mosaic law of the Torah. And many more were added, of course, over the centuries as additional extra protective layers were put in place just in case. And so these people that Paul has in mind, the Israelites, are conservative, orthodox, God-fearing Jews. They are not heathen, they are not evil people, but they fail to see the need for the grace of God in person, in the person of the Messiah. They concern themselves with outward observances, with rituals, with appearances. Their confidence was in themselves to be saved, on their ability, not on a personal, proper relationship and knowledge of God through His Son, Jesus Christ. They failed to see what the Old Testament scriptures had said, what the Messiah would be, who He would be, and all the requirements of God and the promises in the Messiah. And so Paul, yeah, he can testify against them because he once was just like them. You once were just like them. You were perhaps just like that yourself. Thought you were on off the head of a little rowboat or under the rainbow, straining the oars, and you're going to get there. Just strain those oars enough. <coughs> but not so. One day you heard the gospel, you realized there's another way to be saved. The only way to be saved, and that is through a savior. Paul can testify against him because he was once like them. He knows them, and so he speaks from being on the inside. As a, not as an ignorant outsider who speculates and makes false uh, accusations against them. He's speaking here the truth and love. This is a true assessment because I know, because I've been there. He was zealous for God himself in persecuting the church, as a zealous always a, 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 a sincere. He was sincere in his zeal. Thought he was doing God a service, God a favor by persecuting the church. 
You see, yes, you can be zeal, zealous, you can be uh, full of zeal, you can be very sincere, but you can be sincerely wrong, can't you? Mm -hmm. Zeal for God can mask the real need that you have for a Savior, and that they have for a Savior. Of course, we know of many extreme cases. We think of the Islamic jihadist, the ISIS fighter. Let's say he has zeal for God, doesn't he? Mm -hmm. She. And think of all the evil atrocities that have been committed by every religion by zeal for their God, in the name of zeal for God. What about the many people around us? Not those extreme cases, but what about the many people around us who believe that there is a God? They don't deny God's existence and that by being a, a good person that He won't judge them and that He won't send them to hell for all their other sins and hope that their good deeds will, will tip the scale in their favour. What about all of those? All those people who have been christened, those people who have been uh, circumcised or catechized through some catechism. What about all those who have been baptised and you are not walking with the Lord? You might even be involved in church activities. And you're well meaning. These are good people we're talking about. They're not bad people in themselves, is it? They're, they're good people by worldly standards, but they're not perfect. And as they stand before a perfect God, they will all will be exposed. Every hidden motive, every impure thoughts, everything you've ever done will stand and be exposed before God. And that is why they and you and every single one of us, why we need the grace of God and why we need a Savior. You see, all the good things that we do, they cannot save us. And as Paul testifies, yeah, and then elsewhere he talks about how they're spiritually blinded, how they are using a key for another door. Not the door, not the only key that can go through the door of our Lord Jesus Christ and be saved through Him. God's ways, His righteousness. Instead, the verdict is that they did not know the righteousness of God. That's what He says. They did not know the righteousness of God, God's righteousness. What is God's righteousness? Paul has defined it for us already in chapter 1, verse 17. Maybe if you've forgotten, because it was a long time ago, when we looked at chapter 1, verse 17 in Romans, he says in the Gospel, the righteousness of God is revealed, a righteousness that is by faith, that you are saved by faith in the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ to save you, and not by works, not by the law. God revealed that His righteous ways, God's righteous ways, God has revealed them in the Bible to us. So it's right to follow and to obey Him. God had established a covenant relationship with His people in the Old Testament and given them the terms and the conditions of that covenant to be followed in the form of the law. But His people had consistently proven that they could not follow them. And they consistently broke the rules and therefore they broke covenant and are described as unfaithful and need of a Saviour. They did not live by faith in God, but sought rather to establish their own righteousness, to follow Him in their own strength, according to their own way, not by way of faith in God's Son, Jesus Christ. And therefore, they sought to justify themselves somehow by all the things that they had done, instead of God justifying them by providing for their sins in the person of Jesus Christ. That's why in Christ the Gospel is revealed what God did has done for us all as what he had promised in the Old Testament he did in the New Testament by sending his son to die for our sins in our place but they rejected him and they did not accept him as people still today reject the Lord Jesus Christ and will not accept him good people are the world stands instead they sought to establish their own righteousness based on what they can do instead of what God has done in Jesus Christ, the Messiah. And therefore, they committed the ultimate rejection of God Himself by rejecting His Son. They did not, as He says here, they did not submit to the righteousness, to God's righteousness. Remember that old classic song, Frank Sinatra's summarized the philosophy 
of this age that many live by. But at the end of it all, I want to say, I did it my way. Not God's way, I did it my way. I will not submit to God's ways, to trust and to believe in His Son to be saved. And all who believe in good and to all that God is a holy God will in their natural selves will look for what is good and look for what is right and try and do those things that they can do. Things that are manageable and all the good things that we can do to things that we can handle ourselves in, attempt, in an attempt to live by a code to establish their own righteousness instead of living by God's righteousness. By being good people and doing good works, possibly even religious rituals, but not living by faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. But these things cannot save you, as you can never be good enough. You can never be perfect. Before a holy God, only perfection is good enough. Something nobody can do. But there is a way, as the gospel has revealed, to the righteousness of God, the person of Jesus Christ and faith in Christ opens that to us. Why should people do such a foolish thing? Like, put their faith in Jesus Christ. Or simply put, as he puts it in verse 4, because Christ is the culmination of the law. He is the only real hope to satisfy what the law has required of us 100%. He lived the life that we should have lived and couldn't. And therefore he died the death that we should have died in our place. Then when he uses the word culmination, maybe you've got a different version in the Greek. It's telos, which, which can also mean the end goal. That Christ is the end goal, and he has reached the finish line. It is, it is to tell us that it is finished. He's done the work. It's over. He's cracked the code if you want. Uh, he's broken the code so that we are no longer, as verse, chapter 6 verse 1 says, no longer under the law, but under grace. He is true holiness, and he is the way to the righteousness of God, because he is the righteousness of God in verse so through him that we receive the righteousness of God as a man. He, Jesus Christ, lived a perfect life by God's laws and, and standards, therefore satisfying all of its demands. And he offers that key of salvation to all who believe in him and are willing to trust in him by faith. I hope and trust, I don't assume that this morning, that you have all put your faith and trust in him to be saved. Abandoning the notion, not abandoning the good works and the good things that you do, but abandoning the notion that some of those things can save you and resting securely, wholeheartedly, 100% on the promises of God that says through faith you can be saved for everyone who believes, as it says here. Is that a wonderful promise? Does that give you hope in your prayers? Hope for your even family, as far gone as they might be, brute beasts they might be, as some of us once were brute beasts, that gives us real hope in the integrity of God's good news, that for everyone who believes they can be saved, the door is open, and in reality though, we know not all will go through that door and be saved, but let it not be because we didn't care enough to not pray for them. Because we didn't care enough to not tell them the good news and the gospel. Yes, we recognize that it's the work of God and the grace of God, and only by that can they be saved. But we need to be faithful in our prayers and faithful in our petitions to them to accept the Lord Jesus Christ. And so we do so. Choosing rather to try and establish their own righteousness, we all know such people. Those people who do such a thing, our desire is to see them get saved by giving them no rest in our prayers. No, I'm not praying that their lives might get easier or better in some ways. Not praying that their problems and their insecurities would just go away. Not asking God to help them along their way. But rather, if you really can, pray that they will see the error of what's going on and what they are doing in their ways. And to see that their problems may well be sent by God to get their attention so that they will look to Him 
put their faith in him to be saved. It is God's desire to save people. We have that assurance in the scriptures. Not to condemn people. He says in 1 Timothy 2 verse 3, God, our Savior, wants all people to be saved, to come to a knowledge of the truth. And so we are on good grounds, on God's side, when we pray for the lost. Therefore, do not pray on biblical prayers. And I've, I've listed a couple of ways that we can pray us. I had seven and I added another two this morning. Uh, but ways that we can pray for the unsaved. And I'll probably rattle it off too fast for you to write them all down. Uh, you can watch it online again and you can pick them up there. Rather pray for them to be saved like this. Rather than praying on biblical prayers. First of all, pray that God will remove cold, stubborn, hardness of hearts and the, the, and, and that they might see their sin and believe in the gospel. They were there are just different to it. Pray that God remove and open those hearts and open those spiritual eyes. Second of all, pray God will remove the hardness of hearts and, and the spiritual blindness to receive Jesus Christ. But secondly, Pray that God would open their hearts and eyes to see and believe the gospel. Pray that the deception and the lies that they are living by, that they might be exposed to them. That all false things that they believe and all the empty philosophies that they hold to, that has darkened the understanding that the light might expose those things and they might see the foolishness of what they believe. Fourthly, Pray that God will give you the opportunities and the words to fearlessly, powerfully, accurately, and clearly make known the gospel to them. And God will. Those of you who have been brave enough to share your faith with somebody, you are for a wonderful experience if you've never done that. As God gives you the words, how many times have shared the gospel offers to sit back and think, that was not me speaking there. Mm -hmm. I didn't even know I knew that stuff that I was saying there. You didn't because the Holy Spirit was using you, giving you the words to say to them, insights into their lives that only the Spirit of God could know, and they will see that. Pray that God will give you those opportunities and the words. But we pray for any spiritual strongholds or addictions, the slavery to sin that it might be broken, that they might see the idolatry of sin. They're choosing something, whatever it is, over God and choose that God would break that for them, smash that idol, and that they would look to the Lord to be set free from that. Sixthly, pray that God would give them faith to believe in the grace of God in Jesus Christ. And the only grace that can justify and save them, that they would know the love of God and the full assurance of salvation. Number seven, pray that they would find fellowship with other believers who can strengthen them as they grow in faith in the Bible, in a Bible-believing church. Through that, may you see many come to faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. And then this morning, a little reminder once again that we must pray for the missionaries, those who are working with the lost, constantly remembering them and the work that they are doing. And pray for yourself while you at it, as a missionary, sharing your faith. And then lastly, pray for the backsliders that you know. I mentioned that already. Treat them as unbelievers that God might do a new work in their lives, a fresh work in their lives, that they might return to Him. Now there are some of you who, I hope, have been challenged by this message from the Lord today. And you've got that person in your mind who you know you need to speak to. Perhaps you have already been faithful in this, and this message has just been sent to you just to encourage you to keep on praying, even if it's been years, and even if they've gone even further away since you've been praying for them, that you just keep on praying because the promises of God are that He hears us, and He is merciful, and He is kind. So keep praying. Know that God is listening. But perhaps somebody's come to mind today that the Lord has put on your heart as a burden. I'm going to pray for us, and I'll, I can't mention every person by name that you may possibly know. So I'm not going to call for you to give a shout out of names or anything. You know those people. You pray in your hearts for them by name. I'm going to pray a general prayer 
but you keep them personally before the Lord, by name, before the throne of God, that God will give them no rest until they come to salvation. Lord, that person that is in our mind today, those people, our family, Lord, our, our children, our parents, Lord, our, our friends at school, our, our teachers, Lord, all these people that just come to mind who we know have no belief in you or perhaps do believe in you, perhaps even very nice, very good people in some way, Lord, but do not believe in your Son, Jesus Christ, to be saved. Lord, those people that come to mind this morning, we want to pray for them specifically this morning. Our desire, as you pour into our hearts, you lay them on our hearts, is to see them saved, Lord. We want to see people saved, Lord God. It feels like we've been through a, a barren wilderness of conversions, Lord God, where we've seen so few people coming to the faith and knowledge in the Lord Jesus Christ. Lord, we pray that you would send showers of rain, Lord. That barren wilderness, would, there would be green fields, Lord God, of new converts as we see people coming to faith, Lord God. Lord, I've heard the saying, and you know the saying, everyone reach one. And that is you who's put that before the churches to adopt, Lord God. Everyone reaching one, Lord. And Lord, may we just be faithful in going to that one person as a start and praying for that one person before we go, Lord God. Open their hearts, Lord God. Open their minds. Remove those obstacles. Those, as Paul described, those scales that were on his eyes that fell off when he came to the same knowledge of Jesus Christ on the road to Damascus. Remove those scales, Lord God. <coughs> Lord, we pray for ourselves that we would have this desire for them desire to see people say that we would not be indifferent or careless but that we would care more even if it's a burden for us Lord God may it be a cross that we carry for the sake of the lost Lord God may we be like Simon Lord God who carried your cross Lord may we carry the cross of others to see them say Lord Jesus we do pray that you would give us the words to say that you would lead us to the people that you are busy working Lord God, and that Lord we would be faithful in praying and faithful in sharing the gospel. So help us in this Lord we pray. Lord, as we put them before you this morning, Lord we pray that you would go ahead of us in this and help us for this we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, the worship team, if you want to come up and lead the, the rest of us in praise and worship, Let's stand as we, as we praise our God and as we sing to Him.
who through the blood of the eternal covenant brought back from the dead our Lord Jesus, that great shepherd of the sheep, equip you with everything good for doing his will, and may he work in us what is pleasing to him through Jesus Christ, to whom be glory forever and ever. All God's people say, Amen. Amen. Thank you for joining us. Please join us at 10 o'clock.